Welcome to A Canadian Investing in the U.S., a podcast and YouTube channel focused on Canadians buying real estate with host Glenn Sutherland. Welcome to a new episode of A Canadian Investing in the U.S. This week, my guest is Christopher Katende. Uh, Christopher, let's start by giving you uh, giving us a little bit of a background, uh, uh, maybe some of your story, and then we'll we'll see where this conversation goes. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having me on the show. No problem. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm actually Ugandan. I was born and raised in Uganda till I was about 15 or 16 years old. And then we moved to Kenya. I lived there for about six years. And then we moved to Canada as a family. We moved uh, nine years ago, so 2013. Okay. So I've been living in Toronto since then. And uh, uh, I got into real estate, I would say, in about 2015, 2016. And yeah, uh, doing the U.S. stuff, I would say maybe 2018, 2019 is when I got into it. Awesome. Yes, you're, you got some good experience. That's awesome. Um, what no, Probably no, anyone who listens to the show probably has no idea, but um, when my parents um, finished university, uh, well, you know, back in the day, uh, they actually yeah. went and lived in Africa for three or three, I think it's three years or five years. Uh, they went and mm-hmm. lived over there. Uh, and did like missionary work in Kenya and all out in the little towns in the country, right? So awesome. anyway, thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> so yeah, um, okay. So let's go through your journey. How did your how did your story go when you started uh, doing this investing? Oh, yeah, I, I uh, started in Canada first, then moved to the U.S. Yes, yes, that's correct. Um, so I started off with like you know buy and hold, so condos. Uh, we had like an Airbnb business before you know, the short-term rental market exploded. We were kind of like the first to do that. And we actually started doing like a a rent to rent. So it was like a lease and then we put it on, uh, you know, the short-term rental platforms. And then when they're buying those condos out, uh, we also had a- Oh, so uh, you were leasing them from somebody and then putting them back out as a short-term sort of the arbitrage. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're doing that before it was like, you know, before it was a it, thing. It, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. And then we ended up buying those 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 places, uh, scaling. Then we bought uh some detached and semi-detached properties. Um, and then so I was in between those things, uh, with like long-term tenants as well in some of the properties in Toronto. And then I would drive because I was looking you know, how to expand and you know how expensive, you know, Ontario is. So oh, yeah. I figured, you know, I'll just dr- drive over instead of flying to Alberta or some other market that's cheaper. I could just drive an hour or two down to Buffalo. And that's how I got into investing in the U.S. And I got into a very niche uh, market of uh, mobile homes. So I uh, was doing a lot of mobile deals there uh, using, you know, creative ways and I, I couldn't believe how inexpensive it was to get into it and also how very little competition there was at the time. Uh, because, as you know, Buffalo and like the northern, you know, upstate New York is is not as busy as it is when you go to New York City. So I did a bit of, of that. I had some family and uh, friends in Cleveland and Pittsburgh as well. And so I just drive down there as well and try to find deals. Yeah. Uh, for those ones, I ended up wholesaling a few of them. Uh, we did some subject to stuff there as well, and uh, then moved back, you know, uh, to to Canada full time because you know COVID shut everything down, um, and you know I couldn't drive across the border anymore, yes. so I, I liquidated my whole portfolio in the states there, and uh, then came back to Toronto and I was doing a full time flipping, fix and flip because the market was absolutely insane. Um, so I did that for a while. I did about seven uh, flips, and now I'm back in the states looking at more long-term buy and hold stuff because that's you know that's the market we're in at the moment. That's what makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I'm not looking in the Midwest too much at the moment. I'm looking uh, in the Sun Belt, so Texas um, and Florida. So I'm looking at you know mobile home parks. Um, looking at uh, commercial, you know, triple net deals that I can find that make sense, as well as uh, multifamily. Um, 
I am starting to look in Canada as well because the numbers are just kind of looking enticing at the moment. Yeah. But I'm also trying to, uh, I'm only doing it in a creative way. Um, so if I can do like a, a lease back with, uh, uh, you know, an assignable contract so I can flip it that way without, you know, yeah. using too much of my own money, yeah. I, I can do those deals at the moment. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking for a lot of creative deals because I think they're coming up shortly. So there, you just you just gave me like 40 questions, maybe 50 <laughs> <laughs> from, from that because you did so many different uh, things. Um, yeah. um, maybe we start from the end and we'll work backwards. I, I don't know. Or maybe I'll just jump all over the place. But you literally yeah. just mentioned the lease back, right? Um, maybe uh, talk about that a little bit, how it's structured. Um, I assume you're trying to do, so you do a lease option. So you're trying to set up the uh, future purchase price. Yeah. So originally, and this is this is a deal that I'm currently working. It's in Brampton. It's two properties, and then there's another. So it's two two sellers, three properties, um, two from one, one from the other. Uh, originally, I wanted to do like a, a novation agreement, which is different. I don't know if you've heard about that, but it's where you you know take over you know the property, renovate it, and then put it on the market without transferring, you know, uh, title and all that okay. stuff. So you would have an agreement, but uh, some of the sellers are not really well-versed in creative finance. No, they're not. <laughs> so it's, it's been a little bit tricky. So I figured, you know what, a, a way to make them more comfortable is actually taking care of the lease so that they don't feel like uh, their house is empty and they have to take care of the mortgage. So that way, we lease it, let's say, for a month to two months. I already have my systems in place. I've been flipping for a while. Mm -hmm. And we come in. So that way, another issue was uh, the seller doesn't want people, you know, gaining access to the property, which is why it's still off market. So if we take over the lease, that way we have full access and we can do whatever we want. So we would set up, let's say, for uh, maybe three, four months in advance. That would be the option to purchase. And then we come in renovate it, put it on the MLS with uh, also an assignable uh, uh, clause in there, which would allow us to transfer. Or if the seller is not comfortable with that, we can always do a double close. Uh, I'll just have to talk to my you know, lawyers and see how we can make it happen. So it's just all a matter of trying to solve the seller's problem while also you know, trying to, to make you know, a deal happen for us. No, I love it. And that, that was literally you just answered my two questions. I was going to say, are you going to put an assignment clause in there? Or are you going to double close? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> literally that was my, was that the second thing I wrote down. So that's awesome. I, I, I love this. And I, I, I'm like, especially right now, as there's like some downturns, a little bit more panic, people are getting more and more open to these creative strategies to, mm -hmm. you know, um, be able to, as a buyer, to be able to get in with low down payments, um, you know, maybe do some, some lease options or even like a sandwich lease where you could lease that same thing back out to somebody else. Um, so yeah. I love this stuff. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm right into this. Um, and since we, I'm, I'm sort of going down the path of the sort of creative financing, cause I, I love creative financing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> subject two. Um, this is a topic that I have, I don't think I've touched at all in our 250 episodes or Canadian investing in the U S um, let's first by just explaining to people what subject two is. Yeah, sure. Uh, so subject two is a strategy where you take over uh, someone's existing, uh, you take over title and possession of a property uh, subject to the underlying lien staying in the original owner's name. So somebody's got a mortgage, you know, a beautiful, you know, 2% 30-year fixed mortgage. And uh, as you know, uh, rates are crazy at the moment. Right. So you'd be looking at like seven, eight, whatever. So uh, you would be able to purchase this house, transfer title to yourself, and then have the mortgage stay in the seller's name. Yep. And you just have to demonstrate that you are the one making the payments and uh, it would not affect their credit or their um, debt to, you know, the debt coverage ratios if done right, you know, through the agreements. Now there's always, uh, uh, the scary part is the, you know, the infamous due on sale clause. Yep. And uh, really, when it comes down to the practicality of it, banks do not care 
uh, as long as they're getting their interest paid. And, you know, I've used this not just for properties, but I've actually also used it for my cars. So I had a car rental business um, and I used subject to where I would either take over people's payments or when I was selling my cars, I figured, you know what, I prefer to have this 3%, you know, fixed rate and I would sell the car and, you know, uh, have the cash without me having to pay it back. So um, it's, it's a very awesome strategy in that you can take advantage of those uh, interest rates, yeah. but you also solve a problem with sellers where they might be underwater on their deal, meaning like, you know, the equity just isn't there. And if they were to just outright sell it, they would have money coming out of their pockets um, or they just don't want to deal with, you know, the the headaches of those properties, but they also, you know, don't want to deal with uh, the taxation that comes with, you know, selling it. So there's a lot of advantages that come with it. Yeah. Do you need to notify the bank when you do these? When I started investing in the U.S., I did it by myself and had to go through the growing pains of doing that. GlennSutherland.com slash coaching. A 12-week coaching program done one hour per week over Zoom from the comfort of your own home. Classes are kept to five people to be able to answer everyone's questions. Shortcut the process. Make fewer mistakes. Curriculum available at GlennSutherland.com slash coaching. Uh, yes, sometimes you do. It It, it depends on uh, the type of lender that it is. Uh, but mostly it has to do with the seller themselves. You still have to notify them in the sense that you're, you would be changing uh, where the payment is coming from. Yeah. Um, yeah, but most places you just, yeah. And if you can demonstrate that you know what you're doing and that you have all these systems set up, it's not really going to be an issue. Okay. So <clears throat> just so that for some people, I think it might be running through their head. So the process to do this is you basically have this conversation with the the seller of the property. Um, you basically you might be able to tell them you can give them a little bit extra money if you're willing to take on the subject to give them some 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 motivation to want to do this or you have <laughs> whatever way you want to negotiate this. Um, you get, you want to take over this loan, um, and then you just need to just basically update the bank account. Um, so where the, the funds are coming from, because so they start coming from your fund, uh, your account. You need to show to the seller that you're gonna you have maybe the money to make these payments and what your plan is to do with this property, uh, to take sort of the to make them at ease. And it, and it's that just that easy. You can just start going over, um, and then you'll take the deed. They'll transfer the deed over with a title company from yep. the seller to yourself. And is that it? Is there any other steps that would need to be happen? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's in a nutshell, that's that's it. Of course, the transaction coordinator or the title company would know a lot more about the finer details that go in between and whatever needs to get signed and transferred over to just, you know, make sure a title is clear and all those other things. But in a nutshell, it's pretty much that. The only other uh, aspect would be if the seller is looking to purchase another uh, property, then you would have to uh, draft up some sort of documentation to show that, yes, uh, you are now the one in charge of the uh, uh, payments being made, and you'd have to demonstrate that. Uh, in certain states, it varies, but I think between three to th three to six months or, you know, uh, to show that the payments are being made. I might be wrong about that number, but uh, you just show that, and uh, yeah, it will reflect on their credit and their uh, debt coverage ratios, and then they'll be good to go. And then uh, it also depends if you want to have like a balloon payment or it's just uh, indefinite towards the end of the, uh, uh, the amortization period. So there's just those nuances, but in a nutshell, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Cool. Do you put any clauses in there? Like if you, if they call the note that they take this whole thing back or anything like that, or you, or you, you're still okay with it? Yeah, no. Uh, depends on the seller right this all depend i i do have like a standard agreement that i use uh but typically for the ones that i've done so far i haven't seen many issues um where but we keep updating them you know if, if you have an issue that pops up then you might add that to your standard agreement going forward love it 
I love it. And I think that that's good. We you covered some uh, some subject too finally on this thing, which I which is great strategy. Um you talked about since we're talking, I'm gonna just keep picking through all the creative parts of all these deals you've done. Um at the yeah. start, you're talking about uh, doing some mobile home parks in Buffalo, and you mentioned you did a, a creative purchase on that. What did that look like? Yeah, um it wasn't a mobile home park. I've done mobile oh, homes. In oh, mobile homes. Okay. So I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking to purchase now. I'm looking to purchase parks. Yeah. Uh, but those would be uh, in the you know uh, southern. Oh yeah. Uh, no. No. No problem. But uh, I, I'm, I made a, a misspoke there. But um, yeah. How did that play out? Like, what were you doing then? So you're you're flipping homes. You're buying homes for intensive. Tell us a little bit about how the the mobile home or part your, your little play worked. Yeah, um, so like I said, this is Buffalo, Lewiston, just, you know, yep. Niagara Falls area. So I'll just literally just drive down there. And uh, I started off uh, driving for dollars, which is, you know, mark out every single mobile home park in that area and just drive looking for these, you know, for sale signs that are in the windows and stuff. And you'd be surprised how many of those you find uh, because people just don't think to put it on the internet. And so you've got people who, are literally trying to keep this away and they won't because you're in this little village community and only a few people are going to see that sign posted. Mm -hmm. And uh, so obviously you have to get park approved. Uh, so you, I'll introduce myself to the park managers, let them know what I'm doing and uh, let them know that, you know, I'm going to purchase the home and quickly fix it up and put another tenant buyer because certain parks don't like you to rent the home out when you own it so the way around that would be to sell it on payments right. and uh, so that would be a rent to own type strategy uh, without interest rates so the interest rate would be like built in uh, so essentially yes buy the home from the seller and sometimes it could be on payments as well or it could just be straight up cash depending on how much the homes cost and then fix it up sometimes i wouldn't even need to fix them up i'll just re-advertise them online to get a buyer a bigger you know buyer market yep. and uh, then qualify those uh, prospective tenant buyers that come in that give me a deposit that get qualified by the park as well mm -hmm. and uh, then they would start making the payment so you would have you, you have the lot rent and then i'll um, ask for a specific amount on top of the lot rent so let's say between five and eight hundred dollars and uh, obviously, I would run my comps in the area to make sure that, you know, it's might be a little bit higher or it might be the same amount as a, a regular one, two bedroom rental um, that's in a house or a, a, an apartment. Uh, but they get this pride of ownership knowing that within, you know, five years or however long, they'll fully outright own the home and it will be theirs. And so you get a much higher, you know, uh, tenant quality because you're not responsible for any of the maintenance that happened because they're the owners at this point. And uh, all you're doing is just becoming the bank and the lender. And in some cases, you know, I'll get my full amount that I paid for the home in the form of their first deposit. And then I'll still get first month's rent on top of that. And it would just be cash flow ready to go. Gotcha. And you you said uh, something about the lot rent there. I just want to make sure I clarify. Are you collecting the lot rent or are they just paying the lot rent? No, no, no. Yeah. So because they're getting qualified with the with the park, they are paying the lot rent to the park themselves. Gotcha. Of course, I've got a relationship uh, going on with the park manager. And if they ever default, uh, I'm notified as well before they get evicted because I'm still, they, they, they still a lien on, on the mobile home in, in my name so okay every, like i had an issue actually where one of my tenant buyers passed away um and uh, so the park manager oh. <laughs> yeah. are, we, are we good we're good good you said the park manager passed away yeah uh, no no the my buyer oh your buyer <clears throat> passed away yeah passed away. and so Again, I was having this issue with COVID. I couldn't drive across or do anything. So I had to figure out how to do everything remotely over the phone, get cleaners in and that sort of thing. But I was lucky that I had a great relationship with the park manager. And, you know, there was backlog rent for, you know, a couple of months when I couldn't get a hold of him. 
And when I put in another buyer, they allowed that to be put on in the back end and paid off. So it, it works out well when you have a good relationship with the, yep. uh, the managers. Cool. So um, you mentioned doing like rent to owning this, these trailers back um, or, or home uh, mobile homes back to the, uh, to, to somebody who's going to buy them. Right. Um, yes. There's a lot of different ways to do rent to own. Um, so where my head's going is you could do a lease option where you would uh, keep doing an option contract. The, uh, the deed would stay with you. Basically there's still tenants, but have uh, an option contract to purchase at some time, but it doesn't sound like that's what you're doing. Uh, or you could do seller financing where you're going to transfer the deed right at the bet. And then you're going to be put on the loan as payments, or do you do a contract for deed where you just basically put them on as equitable title on your deed? I'm just curious which way, you like to do your lease options because or yeah. your rent to owns because there's so many ways to skin that cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I I find the easiest way is seller financing. Yeah. Uh, because it also gives so in in New York, uh, you know, certain homes that are over a certain age, uh, you don't even have uh, a title, so you're just doing a uh, 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 what do they call it a seller contract or. A, uh, okay. like an invoice it's it's they're considered vehicles right gotcha. so uh you would just go into the park uh manager's office and uh sign title over right there and then put a lien on it as well and so it would be uh seller finance and they would own it but you would have so it's a combination of the last two things. You still have the equitable uh, interest in it as well until okay. it's fully paid off. Yeah, and because you have your lien in place. How do you put that lien on if it's like a vehicle? Are you still using a title company? Uh, no, uh, you would uh, do it through the um, DMV. Um, oh. Just like you would do a car. It's, like, it's just like a car. I wasn't sure if using it, saying like it's like a car is like as an analogy, but no, it's literally. No, no, it's like literally considered. <laughs> yes, because they ha it's not on permanent foundation. It has an axle and wheels. It's considered a motor vehicle um, by law. I love it. <laughs> that's that's awesome. So those are my creative uh, questions I had. Um, was there anything else on creative stuff that I should have asked you? I don't, I don't know. Before I we kind of go into some of the other stuff I, I saw you did some wholesaling which could be depending on if you're keeping any of them because you could do your own marketing and then keep these properties um that that could also be a creative uh purchase strategy or even a creative uh, selling strategy um where where bus were you doing the wholesaling i didn't write that down in my notes <laughs> uh so i did i did one in uh cleveland another one in uh, pittsburgh actually okay. moon moon township it was like a little town uh, on the outskirts there so Cool. Yeah. And then how, how did you, how do you do your leads? Are you sending out mailers? Are you doing your driving for dollars? Or? Yeah. Uh, these were just driving for dollars stuff. And I just wasn't, they didn't fit my buy box. I wasn't really interested in them. Yeah. Um, so I just remarketed them and uh, assigned the contract. It was pretty like straightforward. Um, this is not something that I'm doing on like a yeah. uh, daily basis, but I'm, I'm thinking about getting more into it now because, uh, when you do your uh, signs on lawns and stuff like that, they're very, uh, as well as like Facebook marketing, it's very effective and you get a lot of interest with people trying to sell. And, you know, usually I just turn them away because yeah. I'm not doing that. But yeah, I'm thinking I might get into that again. And um, a wholesaler, to, just to be completely frank with you, a wholesaler that understands creative financing and creative purchases and creative sales is you know, you're going to be able to take a lot more of these properties because a lot of these wholesalers are just strictly negotiating on the price. And if they don't yeah. get their price, they're just like, next one, on to the next one. And they're, you, you're going to have a lot more tools to be able to pick these up. And uh, like, even for myself, like a wholesaler that can pick up something with the seller financing on it, or even a lease option on it, is it's valuable to me, right? Uh, as a, a the end buyer, right? So... Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and yeah, I've, I've I've actually like helped some of my wholesalers like let them know that they they're messing up a deal here by not trying to figure out something creative, um, you know, in terms of either like a, a short term vendor take back or a short term seller finance deal or some other thing or you know just even something as creative as uh, if it's a a, a hoarder house offering uh 
you know, the first bin for free, you know, as a wholesaler, you can get that deal going much faster than just advertising it the way it is. And it's only going to cost you a few hundred dollars, right? Oh, yeah. Those hoarder houses are awesome, especially as if you want to assign them. You could just have someone empty the stuff out and then assign it. And it's worth more money. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh, no, I love it. I love this stuff. So right now, you, you mentioned that you're looking at more Sunbelt states, um, the Texas, the Florida. Uh, why the switch and what happened and what, what are you looking for now? It's the weather, man. <laughs> it's so much nicer <laughs> in the winter. I was just down there. I'm like, ooh, it's nice and warm. <laughs> I'm not I'm not built for the snow. You know, <laughs> driving to Detroit four hours with 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 the, you know the black ice going on or driving down to Niagara Falls, it's just not working for me, man. So actually I forgot to mention we do share an accountant, Ali. Yeah, oh nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank thank you for that. Uh, I was watching one of your shows and you brought him on and he's he's been amazing. But uh yeah, I uh I'm thinking about moving down uh, to one of the two places, either Florida or Texas. And I'm looking to do this there full time because the numbers just make a lot more sense, to be honest with you. Okay. Um, I already have my, you know, corpse set up, my IT team and all that. Um, so it's just a matter of finding the right deals that would make sense for me to go there. And uh, I'll be looking to to make the switch. Cool. And so if you're moving down there, are you going to do like the snowboarding thing where you, you spend like a day under six months down there? Or are you going to go and get like a visa to be able to stay there permanently? Uh, in the beginning, I'll do the snowbird thing. <laughs> and then uh, as the numbers compound, then obviously I'll look into getting the the visa. That's awesome. Do you know, do you know the other thing, though, is uh, I've got friends who've uh, been doing uh, uh, the snowboarding thing. But instead of coming back to this cold place, they go down to Mexico. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting. I don't know if that still counts as the six months or not. But I'm not sure. I, I would I, I'm not sure if it's the who's dictating the six months if it's like I think it might be still the same. I feel like it's Canada Revenue that has all the rules uh, of mm -hmm. the six months. Otherwise you're gonna have you get into tax revenue. You know what? I did a podcast episode on that way back, like episode like 20 or 30 or 40, way back and start with Elliot Mellick. And maybe I'll have to re-listen to it to see if it's it's Canada that's dictating that six months or it's the US mm -hmm. that's dictating it. And let, maybe their visa, their temporary or vacation visa is only allowing the six months. I'm not sure which way it goes. It's interesting. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome, right? You just... <laughs> Just down to Cancun and uh, you're good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm heading down there in uh, January. Well, I'm actually going to uh, Antigua, but yeah, I, I'm warm. <laughs> get some get some heat <laughs> in the winter. Yeah. Cool. Um. So um. So when you're going, you're picking Texas and Florida. You want to stay there because it's warm. Um. And, and you also like the numbers there. Um. In Texas and Florida, like those are massive states, right? Uh. Is there you, I know you said mobile home parks or mobile homes or mobile home parks, commercial or multifamily. Um, what's the strategy to to find these? Because it's kind of we were doing a lot of open to a lot of different opportunities. Um, is the goal to try and get in touch with a broker? Is the intention to try and go down there and find them, or how, what's your your game plan to to start purchasing in those areas? A, a combination of the two. Uh, just looking myself online, you know, got the Crexy going every day. Uh, just networking with people down there as well, other Canadians and other Americans. I try to attend as many meetups as I can when I can go down there because you you meet a lot of people there. Uh, just even uh, cold calling uh, agents that you see have got deals and are doing a lot of deals there. Or you can even just call, call and ask, hey, who, who do you know who's an expert in this area? And people would be happy to refer you. Uh, so a lot of that stuff looking facebook marketplace funny enough has a lot of deals that i feel like are missed out on uh, because they're not properly tagged and that sort of thing so yeah it's a combination of those strategies and then also driving whenever i'm down there I just get a rental car take a couple of days and just drive around and, you know familiarize myself with the area i like that I like, oh, I like joining joining facebook investment groups in those areas that's a huge one as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then I like to uh, even go through those groups and 
see who's actively answering stuff and because they might be open to having a conversation just yep, precisely. chat with yourself and yeah see where it leads and maybe there's some something that works out that you can uh, work out with somebody who's now down there local even before you get there awesome christopher um people want to reach out to you want to get a hold of you um what's the best way to get in contact with you uh yeah i've got uh my website it's smartassetgroup.com uh, and my instagram is the same smart asset group my email is info at smartassetgroup.com so very easy to find you could just google that and i'll be right there or you could just google me christopher katende also be up there awesome yeah and uh reach out like i i, I really did thoroughly enjoy this conversation i love creative financing and uh I don't know why I haven't I've done a podcast on this. Actually, no, maybe I did. The Chris Prefontaine one was kind of on creative financing, but it's been a long time. It's been over a year. Um, and it's one of those things, especially now <clears throat> in a in a flat or a, a trending down market, that it, it's gonna you're gonna be able to scoop up a lot more deals. Um especially now because people are sitting on a lot of their money and sitting on the sideline and may not want to do an all cash deal. You know, as you mentioned, even if you're a wholesaler, bringing a creative deal to any, you know, investor right now, they'll jump on that, you know. Um, yep. So, yeah, I, I think creative finance is the way to go. It might not work well when things are booming and hot, but right now, that's that's the way to go. They don't want their mark properties just sitting there. They don't want to sit them on the market. And they a lot of people don't even want to list them on the market because they know they're going to sit on the market. Yeah. So there's, there's opportunity here right now. This is a, a great thing to pick up. Anyway, Christopher, thank you so much for coming on the show. I, I do really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me, man. I really appreciate it.